upon reaching the Reformation, one is reminded of both the great importance and the great tragedy of the Protestant Reformation. Concerning the great importance, as Robert Farrar Capon puts it, the Reformation was a time when men went blind, staggering, drunk, because they had discovered in the dusty basement of late medievalism a whole cellar full of 1,500-year-old, 200-proof grace, bottle after bottle of pure distillate of Scripture, one sip of which would convince anyone that God saves us single-handedly. Yet, as Joseph McClellan says in the discussion following the third preliminary consultation of the Orthodox Reform Dialogue in 1983, we Reformed tend to overemphasize the uniqueness of the 16th century Reformation. And Torrance will elsewhere compare the Reformation to the great debates of the 4th and 5th century to say how important it was, but also to say it's, it's one of many. It's not the great event. The Reformation was a movement of rediscovery of the radically unconditional grace of God, as witnessed by the scriptures and the church fathers. But it was one movement of many throughout history. As Thomas F. Torrance says at the beginning of Memorandum A on Orthodox Reformed Relations, the Reformed Church does not set out to be a new or another church, but to be a movement of reform within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. Elsewhere, Torrance states, the Reformed Church is the church reformed according to the word of God, so as to restore to it the face of the ancient Catholic and apostolic church. Indeed, the Reformed tradition, says Torrance, does not set out to be a new or another church, but to be a movement of reform within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Jesus Christ. In other words, we should never be happy with being Protestant. We must always, as Protestants, work towards reproachment. As we pass by the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, these words of Torrance are as relevant today as they ever were. As we commemorate the Reformation and celebrate the wonderful rediscovery of the radical grace of God in Jesus Christ, the inherently ecumenical and Catholic approach of Torrance and the Orthodox Reform Dialogue remind us that being Protestant was not the point of the Reformers. Torrance and the Dialogue reminds us that we are, not, we are not faithful to the spirit of the Reformation if we cease working for reform and renewal within the one holy Catholic Church. As Protestants, Torrance reminds us that we should bewail the necessity of the Reformation and indeed the continued existence of Protestantism. Torrance reminds us that Protestants faithful to the Reformation should regularly work towards reproachment with the other wings of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. He reminds us that Protestantism is not the church. We are a prophetic movement of reform within it. If we cease working for reform and reproachment, we cease to follow the reformers. The type of ecumenical reproachment offered by the Orthodox Reform Dialogue also provides us an example of real ecumenical dialogue, as we shall see. The agreement reached by the Orthodox and Reformed that you have in your hands there was authentic and it was substantial. It was not the agree to disagree compromise so often settled for in ecumenical conversation today. The Orthodox and Reformed confessed together a doctrine of the Trinity that bridged East and West on the basis of the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of Athanasius and Cyril. In 1979, Torrance, along with President James McCord of Princeton Seminary, led a group from the World Alliance of Reformed Churches to request that the Patriarch of Constantinople, Demetrius I, permit them to open a theological dialogue with the Orthodox. Torrance and the Reformed were not approaching the ecumenical patriarch with the request of evangelicals who would come later, such as Peter Gilquist and the Campus Crusade for Christ, namely, to become Orthodox. Indeed, the Reformed, led by Torrance, understood themselves as Orthodox and Catholic. Torrance and the Reformed were approaching the patriarch not for a reunion, not as a coming home, but inviting them to join in seeking reproachment. How did such an event come about? And I have a first photo here. 
Well, just one, and we'll pass it around, yeah. And this is a photo, actually, of Torrance and the patriarch who would succeed Patriarch Demetrius, Patriarch Bartholomew. But it gives you an image. It's from, from the archives uh, in Princeton, and it gives you kind of an image of, of, the, of the, the reunion that, that was coming about here. So how did such an event come about? Colin Gunton gives one reason when he states that Torrance offers a reopening of a major historical conversation. A cursory glance at a bibliography of Torrance indicates he clearly was heavily influenced by the Greek fathers and sees himself as returning to the patristic consensus on Intralia, the doctrine of the Trinity. Torrance's vast work on the Trinity, as seen not least in his books, The Christian Doctrine of God and the Trinitarian Faith, are to use the words of George Hunsinger, studded with Greek patristic citations. As has been articulated in my Thomas F. Torrance and the Church Fathers, his approach to all aspects of theological scholarship and teaching was undergirded by the Fathers. One could look at nearly any one of Torrance's books to see that the Fathers are in the background, if not the foreground, of what he is doing. From the connection between Nicene theology and Einstein's relativity theory in space, time, and incarnation, and the realist Nicene theology of the Homoousian and the realist philosophy of John Philoponos in theological science, to the explicitly Nicene Christian doctrine of God and the Trinitarian faith, the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek fathers undergirds all that Torrance does. In his teaching, the connection of Greek patristic and Reformed theology shines clear not only in his new college lectures edited and published by Robert Walker, but also in his new college seminars, where, according to the course syllabus in the Princeton archives, Athanasius' Letters to Serapion was one of three texts studied. The other two were Anselm's, Cure Deus Homo, and Kierkegaard's Philosophical Fragments. Torrance's patristic study was not, however, done for purely academic reasons. Torrance's turn to the East was part of his ecumenical vision, which entailed a reunion of churches on the basis of the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek Nicene Fathers. Torrance practiced this ecumenical theology with Presbyterians, Anglicans, and Roman Catholics from the very beginning of his career as a theologian, professor, and churchman, as seen in his published Conflict and Agreement Volumes 1 and 2, during which Torrance's vision of ecumenical reproachment seemed to be largely reunion on the basis of Greek patristic forms of ministry, sacrament, and epis episcopacy. By the 1980s, however, ignited by Torrance's visit to the Greek Orthodox, Ar Greek Orthodox Bishop of Alexandria while moderator of the Church of Scotland in the late 1970s, Torrance's great work with the Eastern Orthodox began as a rather different type of vision of ecumenical reproachment, one of theological agreement on the basis of the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek fathers. The theological ecumenical work based on the Greek fathers is unique, and as Hunsinger puts it, Torrance's profound interest in Eastern Orthodoxy, not only in the legacy of the Greek church fathers, but also in face-to-face -face encounter with Eastern Orthodox theologians, may prove crucial to interpreting his entire legacy for present-day theology. It was indeed in the Orthodox Reformed dialogue that Torrance's great interest in Greek patristic theology provided the substantial theological and ecumenical ground for a dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox and produced fruit not only for ecumenical theology but also for Trinitarian theology today. The present lecture offers an introduction, critical assessment, and constructive extension of the Orthodox Reformed dialogue spearheaded by Torrance. It explores in particular how the dialogue's ecumenical use and creative interpretation of the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek Fathers has much to offer contemporary Trinitarian theology. Building upon Thomas F. Torrance in the Church Fathers, my earlier book, and presenting ideas and arguments found in the forthcoming book, Thomas F. Torrance and the Orthodox Reform Dialogue, the paper ultimately points to the dialogue's ecumenical use and creative interpretation of the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek fathers as incredibly relevant for contemporary Trinitarian theology. And is there anybody from Whip and Sock here? Whip and Sock? Okay. Well, if they come, they'll have some handouts for the, for the book, some flyers. They said they might, they might have them. If not here, they'll have them at the table. 
In order to critically explore the current relevance of the Orthodox Reform Dialogue, this paper will first explore Torrance's un understanding of the Catholicity of the Reformed tradition and why he understood himself to be able to approach the Orthodox in the way that he did. Then unpack Torrance's understanding of the Church Fathers who served as the basis of his approach, after which the paper will briefly trace the historical contours of the dialogue, including the relationship between Torrance and Archbishop Methodius Foyas, and highlight the contributions of the outcome of the dialogue, the agreed statement on the Holy Trinity, which you have in your hands there, in light of the current conversations in Trinitarian theology. And finally, the paper will suggest possibilities for the extension of the dialogue and the framework of the dialogue. So first, Torrance and the Catholicity of the Reformed tradition. Torrance understood the very possibility of dialogue with the Orthodox to come from the Reformed tradition's inherent Catholicity. Torrance held that the Reformed tradition in which he was a part was inherently ecumenical and as such very much rooted in the Greek Fathers. Thus the dialogue was a true ecumenical work of attempted reunion. In Torrance's Memorandum A, published in Theological Dialogue, Volume 1, he stresses how the Reformed tradition has never sought to be a new church but sees itself, as I mentioned earlier, as a prophetic movement of reform within the Western Church. The Reformed tradition, says Torrance, does not set out to be another church, but a movement of reform. And he explains that the Reformed churches have always been guided by the classical Greek theology of the Church Fathers, especially the great Alexandrian and Cappadocian theologians, the Augustinian doctrine of grace, and the Trinitarian theology of the Greek Fathers. He says all this in his memorandum, which he presented to Patriarch Demetrius uh, when they were opening up the proposal for the dialogue in 1979. Second, Torrance and the Church Fathers. Whereas Torrance's understanding of the Catholicity and Greek patristic rootedness of the Reformed tradition in many ways allowed Torrance to return to the Church Fathers, it is also obvious that his use of the Church Fathers was totally unique. As I've argued, Torrance's reading of the Fathers was creative, consisting of Catholic themes and figures centered around the fulcrum of the Nicene Homoousian, that central assertion that Jesus Christ is of the same essence as the Father. In other words, Torrance's approach to the Fathers was Christocentric in a creatively synthesized Reformed patristic theology. As Robert Walker states, Torrance is a dogmatician concerned to listen to the Fathers and think out with them the evangelical faith. He looks through their eyes to know the same realities of God and faith as he sees through Reformed eyes. Indeed, Torrance approached the Fathers from a Reformed and ecumenical perspective. And Dragas elucidates that Torrance seeks to build up his theology on the one historical common ground. He is prepared at the same time to confess in full modesty and sincerity their historical particularities between the different traditions but to fortify himself only with the positive forces of that common ground. Synthesizing the Church Fathers into Catholic and Evangelical themes, Torrance essentially extrapolates what he sees as the best of the patristics, the best of the Reformation, and the best of the modern eras of the theological tradition, combining them and recentering them upon Jesus Christ and his gospel of grace. As Robert Walker again states, Torrance's theology is highly original, which does not mean first and foremost that he developed new concepts, although he did, but that he made new connections between known theological ideas and concepts. For him, originality was not necessarily thinking new thoughts, but making new connections. Torrance then reconstructs the patristic tradition around the Homoousian into streams or threads in theological history. These theological streams as shall be seen, drive the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue's approach to reaching agreement on the doctrine of the Trinity. And many of the prominent texts in Torrance's reconstructed streams and themes undergird the agreed statement. Torrance believes that certain eras of theological history captured the inner structural of the gospel best. Torrance sees these eras connected to one another in an evangelical stream, which is something of a golden thread that runs throughout theological history. Within, within the evangelical stream, the three instances that best captured this inner structure are Nicaea, particularly Athanasius, the Reformation, particularly Calvin, and contemporary evangelical theology, particularly Karl Barth. 
Torrance sees the fathers and the reformers as complementary to one another. He says that the Reformation emphasis on grace is complementary to the Nicene emphasis on oneness in essence between the Father and the Son, in many ways bringing Nicene theology to its logical end. For Torrance, Bart is ultimately the funnel through which the Nicene theology of the homoousian of Christ and the Reformation theology of the homoousian of grace are dynamically combined and filtered into contemporary theology. In his essay in uh, Karl Barth, Biblical and Evangelical Theologian, which I was rereading on, on the train up here, I was struck that Torrance even states that both Barth and Athanasius were fighting contra mundum. He, he uses the phrase for both of them. For the evangelical and Catholic faith of the homoousian against forms of liberal dualism in their day. It is in this imaginative synthesis of the church fathers with the issues of his own day that Torrance offers perhaps his greatest or at least most creative contribution to patristic study. Like Newman before him, Torrance reads the church fathers into contemporary debates and reads contemporary debates back into the church fathers. In Karl Barth in the Latin heresy, Arius's division of the divine logos from the human Jesus sheds light on 19th century liberalism's division of the Christ of faith from the Christ of history. In Torrance's memoranda on Orthodox reform relations, Nestorian dualism between the human and divine Jesus sheds light on federal Calvinism's doctrine of the limited atonement. In the Trinitarian faith, the problem with the Cappadocian father's emphasis on the person of the father as Arche of the Trinity sound very much like John Zazulis' work in social Trinitarianism. In preaching Christ today, Augustine's implicit pagan dualism sounds almost exactly like the critiques Karl Rahner had of post-scholastic Roman Catholicism, critiques which Torrance greatly appreciates. Torrance's amalgamation of contemporary theological debate with patristic debate is again perhaps his greatest strength. It's where he's his most creative in his use of the fathers. And he applies the fathers here to his own context, very relevant. Torrance has a very dynamic way of using historical texts, and he jumps from the 4th century to the 16th century to the 20th century, often in one sentence. He uses 5th century heresies to critique much later theological problems. This can be an extremely helpful application of the fathers to contemporary problems, and a successful attempt at what Georges Florovsky has called a neopatristic synthesis. Yet it can sometimes be highly confusing. Here, Torrance's greatest strength may have also been his greatest weakness. He made the fathers very relevant for his, for his contemporary time by viewing the ways that Athanasius' attack on Arianism overlapped with his own contemporary battle with liberal theology. However, it can be oversimplified sometimes, simply because Arianism, though similar, was certainly not the same as 19th century liberal theology. Despite the strong similarities between Bart and Athanasius, Arianism and 19th century theology, the two surely had their differences. For example, in Karl Barth and the Latin Heresy, Torrance paints a picture of Athanasius and Barth as both fighting the same perennial battle against dualism. In many ways, this is typical of Torrance, and his favorite, favorites throughout church history tend to sound very similar to one another in their commitments and in the theological battles that they're fighting. In light of these moves, Micah Betts, in his critical introduction to the new edition of Trinitarian Faith, suggests, albeit hesitantly, very hesitantly, I would say, that Torrance's work on the Church Fathers on the doctrine of the Trinity, and thus the very much connected Orthodox Reform dialogue, might reasonably, possibly, be placed within the context of what is called second wave Trinitarianism. As Habet says, this certainly seems to be the un unstated implications of third wave Trinitarians. Sarah Coakley, from whom the term originates, outlines the three waves of Trinitarian thought from the 20th century until today. The first wave, consisting of figures like Bart, Rahner, and Lasky, were united in their concern to loose Trinitarian theology, and this is a quote from her, from any vulnerability to critique from secular philosophy or science, and thereby evade the metaphysical roadblock that had seemingly been constructed, seemingly been constructed impassably by Kant against all doctrinal speculation about God and God's self. The second wave, building off the first wave's recovery of the doctrine of the Trinity, no longer had the enemy of the Enlightenment's avoidance of metaphysics. Rather, according to Coakley, the bogeyman in the second wave was now modernity's turn to the subject, and in particular, 
its anthropological emphasis on individualism and atomism. Exemplified in figures like John Zazoulis and Colin Gunton, the second wave championed the social doctrine of the Trinity and all it has to offer in its understanding of a personhood that exhibits the interconnectedness of humankind. Now, Torrance was certainly writing on the doctrine of the Trinity and engaging in the Orthodox Reformed dialogue during the height of second wave Trinitarianism. We're talking the 1980s and 1990s. Yet, as Habetz makes clear, Torrance does not use the Church Fathers in the stereotypically second wave fashion. For, and I quote Habetz here, in Torrance's hands, the Fathers are not a static monolithic thing to be reckoned with. Rather, tradition is one aspect of the Church universal, as together, under the Spirit, and in the word, the people of God discern the mind of Christ, end the quote. Indeed, as I have argued, Torrance's approach to the fathers is a creative reconstruction of the patristic Greek East into reformed and ecumenical theological themes. The variety of Catholic themes and figures that dictate and undergird Torrance's approach to the fathers, making his work at the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue unique and difficult to categorize outside of the categories it provides for itself. Indeed, Habetz acknowledges the difficulty in taxonomizing Torrance within any of Coakley's categories. Notably, one third wave Trinitarian telling the story of second wave Trinitarian and Trinitarianism and social Trinitarianism as largely a failure, writes that Torrance does not fit the story. Ultimately, as Habetz concludes, Torrance's work on patristic theology has been largely ignored by third wave Trinitarians like Coakley, Ayers and Holmes, and thus one can only conclude that Torrance's work does not fit the narrative of Coakley's three waves. Torrance's work on the Trinity does not fit the East-West divide, so often caricatured by third wave waivers as being completely divided by those in the second wave. Rather, Torrance's understanding of the Church Fathers on the Trinity is ecumenical, and it seeks to understand the Fathers as part of the living tradition. And thus, despite Torrance seemingly being lumped into the second wave slot, by many third waivers, implicitly if not explicitly, he does not fit into this category neatly, if at all. Thus, it is important to consider what wave, if any, Torrance fits in his work on the Trinity and in the Orthodox Reformed dialogue. Ultimately, Torrance's understanding of the Fathers was something entirely different than the categories presented by the three waves. The real evidence of this is his work on the Orthodox Reformed dialogue and the agreed statement, which offers a better, more nuanced version of third wave Trinitarianism. Yet, it continues to be under or really unutilized in the current conversations. And so, a brief historical outline of Torrance and the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue. I have some more photos. Two different ones there as well. So in, in image one there, if you see the image, image labeled one, you'll see it, it's a, on the back of the photo, it's a label that says, photograph taken at the Greek consulate general commemorating the Archbishop Methodius of Thyatira in Great Britain's visit to Edinburgh in May 1980. You can see Archbishop Methodius there on Torrance's right. And I expect you'll uh, recognize Torrance there. <laughs> Image six from the left is Archbishop Methodius, Dr. Hugh Torrance, Ian and Morag Torrance's son, Patriarch Bartholomew I, who succeeded Patriarch Demetrius, and then, of course, uh, TFT in the back there. Torrance states, the impetus for the Orthodox Reform Dialogue came from a deep theological rapport that had developed between Archbishop Methodius of Axum, as he then was, this is a quote from Torrance, and myself, over the understanding of the classic Alexandrian theology as represented above all by St. Athanasius and St. Cyril, and our appreciation of its scientific basis. The aim of the dialogue was to begin from a Greek patristic common ground and build together from there. And so, says Torrance, in his introduction to theological dialogue, Volume 1. At that first meeting in Istanbul, considerable attention was given to problems of method and the underlying assumptions that gave rise to divergence in doctrinal formulation 
and in the structure of ministry. Torrance notes that most ecumenical dialogues have been concerned primarily with order and form rather than with theology, but that a different route was taken with the Orthodox Reform Dialogue, beginning with theological consultations that he says had a rather different objective. It was ultimately through the ecumenical and theological friendship between Torrance and Foyas, in particular their agreement that the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of Athanasius and Cyril is central to any theological dialogue, that the Orthodox Reform Dialogue was born. It was the Reform who approached the Orthodox with a proposal for dialogue. It was also Torrance who initiated the proposal for dialogue through his collaboration with Methodius Foyas and ver various scholarly and theological contexts. And here's where we get to the crosses. So if, if anybody saw TFT wearing these, when we get to discussion, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, solicit your thoughts on it. So image 7A is the pectoral cross that Ian Torrance, th these are all in the archives, by the way. It's the pectoral cross that Ian Torrance says his father was most fond of wearing. He wore, he wore this everywhere. Um, you can see here in image 3, he's wearing it. And you can also see in image five, he's wearing it as well. And so Ian suspects that that is the pectoral cross that I'll mention in a moment that Archbishop Methodius uh, gave Torrance when he ordained him honorary proto-presbyter. Now, the only problem with that is that the back of it has a date of 1977 engraved upon it. And my understanding is Torrance was ordained honorary proto presbyter in 1973 when he visited and gave the lectures on the commemoration of Athanasius. So there's this cross, which I'm afraid I've cut off the bottom from it in the picture, not in real life. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Ian, Ian says that his father was also uh, very fond of that one as well, maybe secondarily to the other one. And so he wondered if maybe that was based on what I was talking to him about those, the dates. He thought maybe it was that one, but in all the photos that I could find, TFT is, is wearing the, the first one, uh, image 7A. So we can talk about that. I'd, I'd be very curious in being able to identify uh, which one. I'll, I'll say more about, about those crosses in a moment. The relationship between Torrance and Foyas during the 1970s provided the seedbed for the flowering of the Orthodox Reform Dialogue, which would begin in the early 1980s. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Torrance and Foyas collaborated academically in various lectures and journals. In 1970, says Torrance, formal contact was then made between the Patriarchate of Alexandria and the Church of Scotland. Shortly thereafter, in 1973, Torrance was invited to give a series of lectures in Alexandria in commemoration of Athanasius, who died in 373, an event which ultimately led to his ordination by Methodius Foyas, who was the bishop, as honorary, and this is in quotes, honorary proto-presbyter in the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria. Torrance even received the pectoral cross worn by Greek Orthodox priests to prove it. And so we, so the, again, image 7a, Ian thinks that that, that is the one. Uh, according to Ian Torrance, he, Torrance was given this proto-presbyter cross by Archbishop Methodius. It was specially and very carefully dis, designed by Archbishop Methodius. It was in blue, which Archbishop Methodius thought was a Church of Scotland color. And in design, it used the cross slash crosslets of Jerusalem, which also appear in Torrance's coat of arms. The Proto-Presbyter cross was also designed to depict the Salvator Mundi rather than the Theotokos in light of Torrance's great Christological emphasis in his theology. And so, whether that was the Proto-Presbyter cross or not, that was the one that seemingly Torrance wore around. Ian said he was hesitant to even include it in the special collections because it, he knew how special it was to his father. Um, so we think that's the Proto-Presbyter one, but again, we'll talk about that. Now, George Dragas says this was an unprecedented and unusual event, and it caused some controversy among the Orthodox at the time. It was officially explained that this honor was an ad hoc event and did not in any way establish a precedent. 
It was a spontaneous act of honoring a person who had made such incredible contributions to the understanding of the legacy of the Church of Alexandria, as well as to the reproachment of Reformed Christians to Orthodoxy. So we can talk about that, but you know, thinking, thinking about a very high view of ordination that the Orthodox have, it, it's interesting to think nevertheless uh, that he, he was ordained. He was honorarily, he was ordained as honorary proto-presbyter is, is the phrase, ordained as honorary proto-presbyter. And so, whilst the office of honorary proto-presbyter is perhaps unusual, this did not stop Archbishop Methodius, and this is much less official, from promoting Torrance, no doubt with a wink in, in his eye, to the office of Patriarch of Scotland during T, years later in the Edinburgh Monitorial Office, according to George Dragas. When Torrance was elected moderator of the Church of Scotland in 1977, one of his first visits as moderator was the, to the Patriarchate of Alexandria. Torrance, following moderators before him, began a tour of visitation in his new official capacity of other Reformed churches throughout the world, but he included in this visitation many Orthodox churches. As Draga states, he was the first Reformed moderator to visit in his term of office Orthodox churches along with sister churches of the Reformed tradition. It was through his friendship with Foyas that he was able to make these official visitations, during which he began sowing the seeds that would grow into the Orthodox Reformed dialogue, beginning less than a decade later. It was in his capacity as Archbishop in Great Britain, however, that Methodius Foyas would co-lead the Orthodox Reformed dialogue with Torrance. Although he would later be removed from his Episcopal and Ecumenical positions in Great Britain and replaced in the latter by John Zizoulis due to, indeed, Byzantine intrigue, if the correspondence provided in the Princeton archives is any indication. On the importance of his relationship with Foyas, Torrance states, and this is a quote, since apart from the personal friendships that had grown up over the years, these contexts, contacts had been brought about and continued to be sustained by profound theological accord. It seemed right that an attempt should be made to engage in formal theological consultations with the ecumenical patriarchate with a view to clarifying together the classical bases of orthodox and of reformed theology and in the hope of reaching the same kind of profound accord with respect to the theological axis of Athanasian Cyrillian theology to which the reformed church has looked as having a regul regulative force in its understanding of Christian doctrine, hardly less than the Greek Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Reform Dialogue was thus initiated on the basis of these shared commitments to the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek Fathers. And I have one more image here. And what you're looking at there is not uh, from the Orthodox Reform Dialogue itself, but it has a lot of the people who were involved in it. So it's, the photo is of a gathering hosted by Sir Rio Stockis in Edinburgh to celebrate the honorary Doctor of Divinity degree granted to the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew in 1996. You'll see in there the, the Right Reverend John McIndoe, moderator of the General Assembly in 1996, the Ecumenical Patriarch. You'll see Archbishop Methodius. You will see Metropolitan John Zizoulis. And you will see Father George Dragas. You'll see Professor Ian Torrance. And I believe those are the, the highlights in relation to what we're talking about. So as you look at it, see if you can identify the figures. The Orthodox Reform Dialogue, begun therefore on the basis of the friendship between Torrance and Foyas, proceeded with five consultations, three unofficial, two official, and one concluding in 1979, 1981, 1983, 1988, 1990, 1992. Throughout the Reformed and Orthodox readily admitted that there are historical and ecclesiological differences and divisions in the practice and expression of their faith that must be acknowledged. For example, the Orthodox emphasized the undivided church until the 11th century, whereas the Reformed are largely responding to medieval scholasticism. However, they ultimately agreed that at the core, each group's understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity is in agreement, and so they constructed the agreed statement on the Holy Trinity. The initial preliminary consultation took place in Istanbul in 1979, 
And it was marked by a warm sense of Catholicity between the Orthodox and the Reformed. Although real theological issues were, of course, heartily discussed. The Istanbul Consultation consisted initially of the Reformed, led by Torrance and James McCord, presenting their memoranda on Orthodox Reformed relations to the Orthodox Patriarchate and Fanar in Istanbul. The memoranda written by Torrance and Dragas, who was Torrance's former student and by then teaching patristics at Durham, present a bold proposal to the Patriarch, namely that the Reformed, as part of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, wish for reproachment on the basis of their shared foundation with the Orthodox, the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek Fathers. George Dragas recalls Torrance sharing a draft with him prior to presenting it at the 1979 consultation. According to Dragas, it was detailed, and at the heart of it, there was a specific proposal that the theological dialogue should start with the doctrine of the Trinity according to the Nicene theology of Athanasius and Cyril, and not that of the Cappadocians. He justified this by pointing out serious problems that Orthodox theology had developed over the years by over-reliance on the Cappadocians, to the neglect of the Alexandrians, and more or less suggested that the dialogue with the Reformed theologians would supply answers to the problems of the Orthodox. Upon Torrance's request, Dragas then wrote a second version, and Torrance presented both to the Patriarch. And he tells Dragas the Patriarch was delighted with both. Apparently, they both received a good reception. The official minutes record that the initial discussion following Torrance's memoranda were marked by a warm cordiality between Orthodox and Reformed. Demetrius I, the Orthodox Patriarch, a gentle benign man, according to George Dragas, delivered the initial address in Greek. It was a warm and appreciative welcome in which the Reformed delegation was assured, and this is, these, are, these are from the minutes, was assured of the personal desire of the ecumenical patriarch that the dialogue between Orthodox and Reform should proceed with goodwill, with courage, and with hope in our Lord. And uh, Patriarch Demetrius's address uh, will be in the forthcoming book, so if you want to read it, you can, you'll see it there. It's also contained in the minutes. The official minutes from the initial consultation in Istanbul highlight a number of key methodological similarities and differences that came to light during this first conversation. The similarities, and as Patriarch Demetrius I says in his address, there are many common points, largely pertain to shared commitments on the content of the Christian faith. And the differences largely pertain to the distinctions in form of expression, worship, church government. The official minutes from 1979 suggests the discussion following the various papers saw the Reformed delegation arguing that the di differences on the Reformed side, for example, and they list these, identifying Holy Scripture with Revelation, the simplicity in worship and in churches, identification of two sacraments rather than seven, and Presbyterian church government, are not due to the content of Reformed theology, nor even representative of classical Reformed theology and form, but they are rather Calvinist and Puritan, or even Renaissance developments. Thus, the sense that the official minutes give of the dialogue following Torrance's initial paper on Orthodox Reform relations is that the Reformed are making intentional efforts to show the Orthodox we're very much like you. Indeed, both groups seem to desire erratic relations, and they seem open to relegating a number of beliefs and practices to the realm of secondary importance. In his opening address to the Orthodox, the president of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, James McCord, articulates that the Reformed have historically felt very close to the Orthodox because of their concern for the apostolic faith. This opening address will also be in the book, by the way. Torrance states, great appreciation for the approach offered by the Orthodox. Metropolitan uh, Chrysostomus of Myra uh, from the Orthodox side states that the Orthodox have also considered the Reformation as a protest against the Western establishment and as part of the schism in the Western Church, that's a quote. Metropolitan Chrysostomos also articulates in, in his opening address that the Orthodox appreciate the re reform concern for the truth and the witness of the early church. Thus, the Orthodox and Reform dialogue began with a strong shared commitment to an emphasis upon the theology and life of the early church. The Orthodox clearly understood themselves as consistently faithful to the patristic church, and the Reform clearly understood themselves in their protest against medieval the medieval church as returning to the patristic church. And so the two delegations proceeded on this important and essential common ground. 
The dialogue proceeded with two more preliminary consultations in 1981 and 1983. It was in the two official consultations occurring in 1988 and 1990, as well as the concluding session in 1992, however, that the real discussion about the doctrine of the Trinity developed. At these later official consultations, the Reformed and Orthodox made the important commitment to avoid discussing the filioque clause itself. And the Reform stated, as regards the filioque clause, the Reform members stated the prevailing position among the Reformed churches according to which the above clause should be removed from use, since it did not belong to the original version, but that the theological issues relating to the filioque controversy should be discussed with a view to reaching a common mind. Dragas elucidates on this commitment, stating, the critical question of the filioque was never actually discussed at the dialogue. In fact, it was strategically left for later. Torrance mentions this in, in the final essay in Theological Dialogue, Volume 2. He says, we, maybe, we can not, maybe the next step is talking about the filioque itself. So it was strategically left for later at the dialogue. Draga said, that was on my advice to Tom, because I said, if you start with the filioque, you'll never get anywhere. <laughs> Thus, the official consultations of the Orthodox Reform Dialogue began with discussion of the issues surrounding the filioque, but avoided the explicit issue itself, a move of great ecumenical importance, as will be seen in the agreed statement. According to Torrance, after working through the doctrine of the Trinity together for the two official consultations, the Reformed and Orthodox concluded at the dialogue that they agreed on the content of the doctrine, and they produced as their fruit the agreed statement to express their substantial agreement. Torrance and Dragas were tasked by the dialogue to draft this important text, after examining and reflecting upon key texts such as Athanasius's Letters to Serapion, Basil's On the Holy Spirit, Gregory Nazianzen's Theological Orations, Calvin's Institutes, and Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics, as well as the papers presented at the meetings. And this is a list given in various places of the texts that they used for this. After examining these, they produced the agreed statement, agreed upon at the concluding session in 92. The document represents a major achievement in ecumenical theology inasmuch as it presents a doctrine of the Trinity which preserves both Greek and Latin commitments to the Trinity of persons and unity of being in God, the Holy Trinity. Drafted in 1989, revised at a meeting in Geneva in 1991, the document was not completed until 92. Torrance wrote the initial draft, but Dragas recounts that when Torrance brought it to him, he was concerned, quote, that, this, that his draft of the statement was much too reformed and Torrentian. There was terminology there which, while claiming to be patristic and Athanasian, says Dragas, was in fact full of neologisms, which would be unfamiliar to the Orthodox. That is, Torrance's initial version must have been too dominated by a theological reconstruction of the Fathers, like we talked about earlier. Torrance and Dragas responded with one another for the next two years regarding the agreed statement. There's a lot of their correspondence in the Princeton archives about this. And they would meet at Torrance's home in Edinburgh, on which occasions Dragas would stay over and Torrance would have breakfast ready in the morning to fuel a day of Trinitarian conversation. In a letter to Torrance, Dragas writes, I've made a few comments on our text which are not difficult to deal with. The one I particularly find difficult is the point on page 7 that monos is identical to trios. Dragas then suggests that they leave the statement out completely. Correspondence with Methodius Foyas, by this point removed from his position in British ecumenical work in an official capacity, indicates a similar sentiment. Foyas states in a letter that he finds Torrance's early draft of the agreed statement to, quote, express in contemporary formulation an Athanasian statement. Foyas, however, suggests that Torrance removed language referring to time and magnitude, such as prior and greater, in the statement. Advice Torrance indeed follows, as we'll see. Foyas also suggests that Torrance clearly distinguished between the being of God and the person of the Father so as to avoid any confusion. That's also done in the statement. Similarly, Foyas urges Torrance to make sure he distinguishes between the particular roles of each person of the Trinity in God's actions. Through collaboration with Dragas and Foyas, Torrance removes his more reformed and Torrentian language, and as he states in a Church of Scotland pamphlet, Though steps have been taken to clarify Trinitarian language, the focus of attention throughout the agreed statement is on the reality of faith in the Trinity rather than specific theological terminology, which naturally must vary in different communions 
with different languages. In his focus on the content rather than the language of the doctrine of the Trinity, the agreed statement, according to Torrance, quote, cuts across mistaken, polarized views of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, according to which Latin theology moves from the oneness of God to the three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, while Greek theology moves from the three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to the oneness of God. What is provided, Torrance says, by the agreed statement of the Orthodox theologians of the East and the Reformed theologians of the West is preeminently a statement on the, tri on the triunity of God as trinity in unity and unity in trinity. Torrance's claim here sounds very much like what third wave Trinitarian theo theologians are claiming to do in their rereading of Nicaea in the patristic era. If this is true, the agreed statement offers a third wave Trinitarianism during the era of second wave Trinitarianism. So the agreed statement and third wave Trinitarianism. Sarah Coakley's third wave Trinitarians are a relatively varied group, including patrologists, church historians, and theologians. However, there seem to be two major commitments that they share. One, the De Reunion thesis is erroneous because East and West really spoke with one voice, and social Trinitarianism, the hallmark of second wave Trinitarianism, is problematic because the church fathers held above all else to the absolute simplicity of God. First, the theme that East and West spoke with one voice is core to third wave Trinitarianism. The one voice of Eastern and Western patristic theology on the doctrine of the Trinity is in short a combination of Augustine as traditionally view, viewed whereby we must start with God's essential unity and of the Cappadocians as traditionally viewed whereby the distinctiveness of the three persons are distinguished only by their relation to one another. Third wave Trinitarians insist that traditional categories of Nicene, Cappadocian, etc. are far more fluid than understood historically. For example, one third waiver, Stephen Holmes, concludes that neither position on the filioque does violence to the received Orthodox and Catholic tradition. Second, according to third wave Trinitarianism, one of the cruxes of the view shared by East and West on the doctrine of the Trinity is a commitment to the simplicity of God. Holmes outlines, Steve, Stephen Holmes outlines patristic trini Trinitarianism in eight points, the first of which is the divine nature is simple, incomposite, and ineffable. Another third waiver, Lewis Ayers, states within the simple Godhead, the distinct word possesses the fullness of the indivisible Godhead. When viewed in light of these two third wave commitments, Torrance, the dialogue, and the agreed statement come to light as highly relevant for the current conversation as a more nuanced and more constructive version of third wave Trinitarianism. The agreed statement offers a real agreement between East and West that is focused on the church fathers without bulldozing over the differences. As Small states, the agreed statement is an extraordinary theological and ecumenical achievement. It offers a way around the filioque problem. When viewed in this light, arguably the strongest contribution of the agreed statement comes to light. It is theologically constructive, whereas the approach of third wave Trinitarianism seems to me largely historical. The agreed statement is structured around key points from the dialogue, which are, one, the centrality of God's revelation of himself as Trinity, two, the distinctiveness of the three Trinitarian hypostases, three, the view that the order of the hypostases in the Trinity begins with the Father, who has monarchia, four, yet the God has, is undivided and one, five, the perichoretic mutual indwelling of all members of the Trinity, and six, the affirmation of the formula, mia usia tres hypostases. And then finally, the assertion that the doctrine of the Trinity is true and actual and indeed the core of the apostolic faith. An examination of the agreed statement highlights a number of contributions in light of third wave Trinitarianism. And I invite you now to follow along in your text if you'd like. Heading one is the self-revelation of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The beginning of the agreed statement consists of the insistence that God as Trinity is more than accidental or peripheral to the Christian faith. Thus, the agreed statement begins by stating, according to the Holy Gospel, God has revealed himself in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Reformed and Orthodox wished through this to express two aspects of their dialogue. One, the fact that Trinitarian theology is central, and two, the connection between who God is to us is the same as who God is in himself. The agreed statement 
As citing John of Damascus and Athanasius, the agreed statement says, quote, to believe in the unity of God apart from the Trinity is to limit the truth of divine revelation. Part of the emphasis here is the insistence on the connection between the imminent and economic trinity. The next heading is three divine persons. The agreed statement then articulates the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity of God through discussion of the three persons of the trinity. Emphasizing both the distinctiveness of persons and the unity of being, the agreed statement argues that the persons at the core work together, for as it states, what God the Father is towards us in Christ and in the Spirit, he is inherently and eternally in himself. And what he is inherently and eternally in himself, he is toward us in the incarnation of his Son and in the mission of the Spirit. This section of the agreed statement utilizes Gregory Nazianzen to uphold the equality of divine persons and greatness, divinity, and order, and Athanasius to preserve the perichoresis or mutual indwelling of the three persons, and thus their unity, preserving the connection of the imminent an economic trinity. The next heading is eternal relations in God. While avoiding explicit and direct discussion of the filioque itself, the agreed statement does articulate a viewpoint concerning the eternal relations within God, stating the Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and abides in the Son. However, the agreed statement argues that the generation of the Son and the procession of the Spirit are unknowable mysteries which cannot be explained by recourse to human or creaturely images. And any procession and any abiding is, quote, beyond all time, akronos, beyond all origin, anarchos, and beyond all cause, anetios. Referring to Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Gregory Nazianzen, Basil the Great, Didymus the Blind, and Cyril of Alexandria, this portion of the agreed statement emphasizes the essential unity of the three persons, particularly in their economic activity, initiated by the Father, affected by the Son, and perfected by the Holy Spirit. The next heading is the order of divine persons in the Trinity. The agreed statement then argues that there is an order within the Trinity that places the Father first, the Son second, and the Holy Spirit third. However, this priority or monarchy of the Father only exists, it says, in relation. That is, it is a monarchy of relation. Referencing Gregory Nazianzen and Athanasius, this portion of the agreed statement emphasizes the equality of persons in the Holy Trinity but with the monarchy of the Father within the order, with a monarchy of the Father within the order. The next heading is Trinity and Unity and Unity and Trinity, the one monarchy. The agreed statement offers a creative and unique version of the monarchy of the Father. It states that the arche or monarchy of the Father within the Trinity is not exclusive to the monarchy of the whole undivided Trinity. Or in other words, to say that God the Father is the fount, foundation, beginning, source of the Trinity does not mean that the Son and the Spirit do not share this. Here, after a slew of patristic citations from Gregory Nazianzen, one from uh, Epiphanius of Salamis, the agreed statement articulates a version of the monarchy of the Father that immediately insists that this monarchy is inseparable from the other three persons, inasmuch as the unity, monos, of God is inseparable from his trinity, trios, due to their shared essence, shared being, shared usia. The next heading is perichoresis. In its articulation of perichoresis, the agreed statement suggests a new answer to the filioque debate. It says, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, but because of the unity of the Godhead in which he, each person is perfectly and holy God, he proceeds from the Father through the Son. For the Spirit belongs to and is inseparable from the being of the Father and of the Son. Quoting Hilary, the agreed statement says, each person contains, envelops, and is enveloped by the other persons. Penultimate heading is one being three persons. And thus the agreed statement says any articulation of the Holy Trinity must begin with the confession of the Synod of Alexandria when it says one being, usia, three persons. But the being of God must be understood in a dynamic rather than an abstract sense. Citing Athanasius, the agreed statement argues that the being of God which all three persons share is ever living and dynamic, not abstract. Finally, the apostolic and Catholic faith. Citing Athanasius, the agreed statement says that the belief in God the Trinity as unity in Trinity and Trinity in unity is the apostolic and Catholic faith. Thus, the agreed statement frames itself as a truly Catholic document seeking to emphasize a truly ecumenical statement of the doctrine of the Trinity. It is this ecumenical nature of the document which highlights its many contributions to the current conversation regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. Namely, it offers a more nuanced account of East and West. It offers a dynamic understanding of God's oneness that bridges the gap between the largely polarized view of social 
slash second wave Trinitarianism and the third wave. And thirdly, it offers a constructive theology in a largely historical third wave movement. Contribution number one, the agreed statement offers a nuanced view of East and West. The agreed statement begins with an important phrase. It says, we confess. Here, Reformed and Orthodox East and West, Patriarch of Constantinople and President of Princeton Seminary, together state with one voice. We confess together the evangelical and ancient faith of the Catholic Church in the uncreated, consubstantial, and co-eternal trinity promulgated by the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. As Torrance writes in his notes slash outline of the agreed statement in the, preserved in the archives, and this is prior to writing it, he writes, the textbook distinction of De Reunion and the doctrine of the Trinity is invalid. And so the Orthodox Reform Dialogue provide an end to the filioque problem, exhibiting basic agreement between Catholic and Evangelical in East and West. The third wave Trinitarian connection of Eastern and Western patristic theology on the doctrine of the Trinity is in some senses a sentiment with which Torrance and the Orthodox dialogue wholeheartedly agree. Despite the widespread assumption of the strict distinction between East and West on the Trinity during his time, Torrance sees Augustine as basically Greek in his doctrine of the Trinity, ranking Augustine's De Trinitate as, in Torrance's words, a supremely great work in Christian theology alongside, and here's, here's a list that shows you how much he liked the text, Church Dogmatics Volume 2, which was, he says, his favorite of, of Bart, Bart's Dogmatics, Athanasius's Contrarianos, St. Thomas's Summa, and Calvin's Institutes. Torrance asserts that Calvin adopted his doctrine of the Trinity from Augustine, who despite lack of knowledge of the Greek language was steeped in Greek patristic theology due to the influence of Hilary. Augustine himself does not really play an active role in the agreed statement, but he was clearly active behind the scenes, at least in Torrance's mind, and Torrance wrote as such in Trinitarian Perspectives. Torrance is often misrepresented as painting Augustine, to use the words of Habetz, as tarred with every brush of the Western heresy. In the dialogue, Torrance does accuse Augustine of Neoplatonic dualism, a sentiment that many of the Orthodox would no doubt have agreed with considering some Orthodox theologians hold Augustine responsible for, quote, most of what went wrong with the West in the Middle Ages, end quote. Torrance certainly accused, accused Augustine of the Latin heresy, and for example, Karl Barton, the Latin heresy, and even accused him of being an ancient version of Schleiermacher. However, Torrance critiques Bart for elements of subordinationism in his doctrine of the Trinity, and one certainly could not accuse Torrance of wishing to depart entirely from Bart. However, rather than proposing a return to Augustine or any of the other Western theologians, Torrance suggests that the dialogue, in the dialogue they should return to the truly ecumenical Catholic and thus pre-East-West divide, church fathers like Athanasius. If theologians do this, argues Torrance, the filioque clause simply falls away. There may have been inconsistencies here in Torrance's use of Augustine, but overall he seems to wish to depart from him as a focus rather than to reject him completely. Herein, Torrance and the dialogue were ahead of their time considering the prevalence of the so-called De Réunion thesis. The agreed statement references Eastern fathers such as John of Damascus, Basil the Great, and Western fathers like Hillary. However, the main figures, quotations, and references are church fathers, Torrance views as Catholic, ecumenical, standing somewhere between the East-West divide like Athanasius, Cyril, Gregory, Nazianzen, and Epiphanius. As Torrance puts it in his common reflection on the agreed statement, which Draga says was entirely written and presented by Torrance at the concluding session, the account of the Trinity given by the statement, and this is a quote, is arrived at through guidance taken mostly from Athanasius and Gregory, the theologian. As such, Torrance and the agreed statement offer a more nuanced view of the substantial similarity between East and West on the doctrine of the Trinity. However, they avoid bulldozing over the real differences. As Torrance says, in the, uh, of the agreed statement, it cuts across mistaken polarized views. And while both the Orthodox and the Reform readily acknowledge they have different emphases in their approaches to the doctrine, they insisted that they agree upon its content. Torrance in the dialogue acknowledge that differences do exist. For example, Torrance takes issue with overly strong emphases on either the unity or the plurality of the Trinity. 
any overemphasis means for Torrance a subtraction from the central patristic assertion that due to the homoousian, humankind has knowledge of God in himself and is truly united to God and saved. In general, Torrance sees departures from this homoousian focused approach that tend towards overemphasis on an Eastern or Western view as falling into some sort of theological or theological dualism, which cuts off knowledge of and union with God in himself. These overly strong Eastern or Western emphases need to be, quote, unknown. This is the language used at the dialogue, taken from Pseudo Dionysius, because they are historical developments that should be reshaped theologically, i.e., Christologically, around the Homoousian. Accordingly, Torrance is, is critical of overly Augustinian and overly Cappadocian approaches to the doctrine of the Trinity, and he critiques them often throughout his writings. Torrance criticizes overly Augustinian approaches as too focused on the abstract oneness of God. This is an approach shared by other second wave Trinitarianism, second wave Trinitarians, for example, Rahner. Torrance also criti criticizes overly Cappadocian approaches as too focused on the plurality of the persons in the Trinity and the implied causality and subordination contained therein. Torrance's primary problem with an overly Cappadocian approach is the understanding of usia as referring to the general in God and hypostases as referring to the particular um, and the related locating of the monarchy and the hypostases of the father. The main problem in Torrance's mind is that this suggests a subordination in the being of God. However, more deeply, Torrance, Torrance takes issue with what he sees as the inherent theological dualism. For Torrance, this move divides God's economy from God's ontology. Contribution number two, the agreed statement offers a dynamic view of the oneness of God. The doctrine of the Trinity agreed upon at the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue departs from the traditional Western acceptance of the filioque, yet it does not simply return to the Eastern rejection of the doctrine. Rather, the doctrine of the Trinity that arose from the dialogue is a reformed version of the classical Eastern patristic viewpoint. And as such, it offers a via media of ecumenical importance. According to Torrance, it is only through the Nicene Homoousian that one is able to approach the doctrine of the Trinity. At the dialogue, Torrance contends that the fathers, especially Athanasius, did not adhere to a general or abstract notion of God's usia, like the Cappadocians did, or at least Basil. The agreed statement articulates this conviction in a few ways. First, it states that despite the Trinity consisting of three persons, as Gregory Nazianzen says, one is not more or less God, nor is one before or after another. For there is no greater or less in respect to the being of the consubstantial persons. Elsewhere, Torrance, following Athanasius, argues that the term usia has, quote, an intensely personal and concrete meaning, meaning end quote. Here, Torrance wants to preserve the dynamic nature of God's usia because he sees the term as personal. The agreed statement therefore articulates that there is only one arche or monarchia of the Godhead and it roots it in the Father, but notably not the person, our apostasies of the Father, but at least as Torrance understood it, in the being of the Father. As such, the monarchy of the Father, and, and by the way, that doesn't, that's not stated explicitly in the, in the agreed statement, but I, I think that's pretty, looking at Torrance's other writings, I think this is how he understood it. Um, the agreed statement could be read that way, no doubt. As such, the monarchy of the Father is on the one hand particular to the Father, and at the very same time shared by the other persons of the Trinity, by nature of their sharing the same being. As McDowell puts it, quote, Torrance holds to a triune conception of divine monarchy. It is here that Torrance and the dialogue's critics often misunderstand the agreed statement of Torrance. Benjamin Dean, for example, argues that the move effectively denies the role of the monarchy of the person of the Father. It is true that the agreed statement roots the monarchy in the being of the Father, again, at least uh, as Torrance understood it, but this includes the person of the Father, no doubt. It, however, is not limited to the person of the Father because of the unity of the divine persons. This is due both to the, perichor to the perichoresis of the three persons, but also, and perhaps even more so, to the insistence of the dialogue in the agreed statement that the being of God is not an abstract essence, but it is the I am of God, a dynamic being essence that is revealed by the Father through the Son, and in the spirit. And here's the real genius, I think, of Torrance and the dialogue's move. By rooting the monarchy and by extension the procession of the Holy Spirit in the Father, they utilize classic, classically Greek patristic thought. 
at least as traditionally understood. However, by rooting it in the being of the Father, they also utilize classically Latin patristic thought, at least as traditionally understood. They arrive at this agreement via a reconstruction of both positions around the homoousian, or as Torrance puts it, by orienting themselves, quote, around the fact that it is only through God that God may be known. Starting with the self-revelation of God, i.e. the homoousian, allows Reformed and Orthodox to successfully bypass the filioque debate altogether. As Ellis says, quote, the filioque is an ultimately unsuccessful attempt to secure what the homoousian rightly understood successfully accomplished. Indeed, discussion of the filioque was, according to Dragas, as we mentioned, strategically left for later. As Torrance later says, a farther study in depth of this procession might help us to find ways of cutting behind the division between East and West over the so-called filioque, for it does not allow of any idea of the procession of the Spirit from two ultimate principles or archai. In many ways, the conclusions of Torrance in the dialogue on the dynamic nature of God's being is something which third wave Trinitarians, I think, would appreciate. They certainly emphasize God's oneness and seem to suggest that the church fathers from both East and West agreed God is at the core one and of a simple nature. For example, again, Steve Holmes states, the divine nature is simple and composite, ineffable. However, the one being of the Trinity discussed in the agreed statement is not the abstract simple being discussed by, at least I'd like to suggest, seems to me, Holmes, uh, if not the other third wave Trinitarians. The, the dynamic being discussed in the agreed statement is understood in a more nuanced and dynamic fashion, largely due to their constructive theological approach as opposed to an historical approach. Which brings us to contribution number three. The agreed statement is constructive theology. Torrance's many connections and reconstructions in his exploration of the connections between Greek patristic and Reformed evangelical theology raise the question as to whether he is fair to the Church Fathers, the dialogue. After all, reading contemporary theological issues back into the Church Fathers is a key critique that third wave Trinitarians have of second wave Trinitarians. Dragas certainly suggests something like this when he says that the original draft of the agreed statement was too reformed and Torrentian. Furthermore, as Fairbairn states, Torrance rarely quotes his patristic sources. Quotes. One might reasonably ask then whether the homoousian of Torrance's patristic consensus is indeed the same as the Nicene homoousian. Connected, one might ask whether Torrance's understanding of the procession of the spirit from the being of the father is really what Gregory and Athanasius would have understood. Georges Florovsky warns of the danger of the Western captivity of the fathers when their theology is forced into categories foreign to them. Is Torrance open to this accusation? Is the Nicene homoousian, which Torrance emphasizes so heartily, really just Western or even Bardian concepts in Greek language? Some critique Torrance along these lines. Foremost in the critiques is that Torrance's reading of the fathers, primarily Athanasius and the homoousian, sounds too Bardian. Colin Gutton puts a related critique forward of Torrance when he argues that Torrance's reading of the homoousian is too Western and sounds Augustinian. It's certainly true that Athanasius' use of the homoousian is not exactly the same as Torrance's. It is indeed then possible to level an historical critique at Torrance here, I think. And it is notable that the critiques that third waivers have of second waivers is often historical. Third wave Trinitarianism is largely concerned with questions of historicity. I think that this is how I think I read Ayers' book. This is how I read really what Steve Holmes is trying to do in his more theological book. And so whereas third waivers are concerned more with historicity and, and looking at what was going on in the Nicene period, I think we see with Torrance and the Orthodox Reform Dialogue something more constructive, something more theological. They don't place what they're doing in the field of history. Rather, it's a constructive, it's a systematic theology, which ultimately, I think, makes it a tenable possibility. Indeed, they even agree that there are historical developments that they need to unknow, they need to forget, they need to place in the realm of secondary importance. They're not aiming to be historical. Their project is constructive and it is theological. Torrance and the Orthodox Reform Dialogue's emphasis on the homoousian provide fresh insight into the fathers by pairing away patristic theology that did not focus on the homoousian and highlighting the classical theology that did. Third wave Trinitarianism, in its more historical emphasis, misses the important constructive move made by the Orthodox Reform dialogue. 
In short, Torrance and the dialogue offer a way of approaching the tradition that avoids, avoids a statisticity of tradition, which says the fathers must be read at face value, and on the other pole, some kind of idiosyncratism that says the fathers can be reshaped in any way that one likes. Torrance and the dialogue sit at the feet of the church fathers, and they theologize with them about God as he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. As Noble states, Torrance's Trinitarian theology holds out the best hope of combining the concerns for divine unity with concerns of social Trinitarians. This type of theological agreement is, or at least should be, the goal, I think, of third wave contemporary Trinitarianism. Torrance, Foyas, the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue, and the Agreed Statement have reached this goal in their understanding of God as Miousia trace hypostases in a homoousian focused, Christologically oriented, Athanasius centered statement of God as unity and Trinity and Trinity and unity. And so we get to the final section conclusion, my proposed way forward. This paper has argued that the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue was a largely successful endeavor and has much to offer the current ecumenical and theological conversation. The concluding section of the lecture will thus proceed by offering some critical engagement, some more critical engagement, considering some areas that perhaps ought to be left in the 1980s and offering some suggestions concerning how to extend the work of the dialogue more generally today. So, point one. Is the Cappadocian distinction really a Zizulin distinction? The dialogue's critique of second wave Trinitarianism. At the dialogue, the Cappadocian fathers, especially Basil the Great, come under heavy critique, at least by Torrance. Torrance argues for a return to the Athanasius serial axis, and he bifurcates this from the Cappadocians, especially Basil, arguing that the Cappadocians departed from a more Athanasian view of the Trinity. Torrance suggests that the Cappadocians held a dualistic view, again, at least Basil, that separated God's being from his persons. John Zizoulis' emphasis upon the Cappadocians and their encapsulation of social Trinitarianism, focusing on the threeness of God's persons, has been critiqued by third wave Trinitarians as being more Zizoulin and existential than Cappadocian. Third wave Trinitarians want to view the Cappadocians as focusing on the unity of God as much as his plurality, departing from the social Trinitarian model of Zizoulis. According to Ayers and Meredith, for example, the Cappadocians insisted upon the essential unity of God, rejecting any notion of hierarchy or subordination. Torrance's critiques during the Orthodox Reform dialogue of the Cappadocians, while not mentioning Zizoulis explicitly either in the minutes or in any published text on the Trinity or around the dialogue from that time, I think are actually very obvious critiques of Zizoulis' reading of the Cappadocians. And so they are probably more about the 1980s than the 380s. It is notable that Torrance's critique of the Cappadocians only really becomes prevalent during this time in the 1980s and early 90s when Zizoulis is publishing his, his books on being in communion. Torrance's published critiques in the dialogue and elsewhere, while not mentioning Zizoulis, are really critical of Zizoulis. In unpublished correspondence, Torrance does talk about this. He accuses Zizoulis of, quote, an existentializing interpretation of the Greek fathers, end quote. Torrance's openness in the dialogue and elsewhere in his published books to many elements in the Cappadocians would suggest he does not wish to dismiss them, nor even dismiss Basil entirely. Rather, Torrance is concerned by certain emphases in their theology, which were being focused upon during his own time by Zizoulis. Second point, is it Augustine, or is it really medieval Latin scholasticism that is the problem? At the Orthodox Reform Dialogue, Augustine falls under critique for his dualism and abstract understanding of God's being. This shows up a lot in the 1983 minutes. However, current scholarship on Augustine now tends to avoid viewing Augustine in light of Neoplatonism and in contrast with Greek patristic theology. Scholarship is tending towards seeing Augustine and the Cappadocians, and indeed more broadly, all Greek and Latin fathers, in line with one another theologically, particularly on the doctrine of the Trinity. Scholars today do not consider Augustine to be a Neoplatonist in his doctrine of the Trinity. Indeed, third wave Trinitarians such as Barnes see substantial overlap between Augustine and the Cappadocians, tracing many of Augustine's Trinitarian themes to the Cappadocians. The critiques of Augustine at the dialogue, however, come largely from the Reformed, mainly Torrance. When examined more deeply, it becomes clear once again that Torrance's critiques are not so much of Augustine, 
but more so of Latin, scholastic, and Westminster theology. At the dialogue, Torrance was mainly critical of, quote, Augustinian thought rather than Augustine himself. He uses that phrase in his published works. Elsewhere, Torrance critiques Augustinian thought for dividing God from his word, and he critiques the Latin tradition more generally for emphasizing the juridical aspect of the atonement dividing God from Christ. Torrance critiques Roman Catholicism and federal Calvinism for essentially the same thing. And so it is reasonable to surmise that Torrance's critique of Augustine are perhaps veiled critiques of Roman Catholicism and Westminster Calvinism, much like his critiques of Arius are really critiques sometimes of 19th century liberalism in cases when Athanasius becomes a 4th century Bart. Perhaps then the Augustine of the dialogue should not be swept away with critiques of Augustinianism. Both East and West, indeed Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic are now returning to Augustine as a church father to be revered from whom much can be learned and whose doctrine of the Trinity is not unlike the Cappadocians and Athanasius. Thirdly, is Palamas really a dualist or was it Lasky, the dialogue's critique of first wave Trinitarianism? In his published works, Torrance sees in Gregory Palamas a problematic and dualistic distinction between God's essence and God's energies, only interacting with the world by the latter, thus, according to Torrance, cutting off God as he is in himself from who he is to us. In the dialogue, Torrance depicts Athanasius and Palamas as intrinsically opposed to one another in basic theology on this very point. The minutes, however, highlight discussion which indicates that perhaps Torrance's problem was rather more with Vladimir Lovsky and his reading of Palamas than Gregory Palamas himself. In discussion in 1983, Torrance suggests that the essence energy's distinction as understood at that time seemed to him to be more Laskian, he says, than Palamite. Notably, Torrance does not interact with Palamas directly in his published text, but only, it seems, Lovsky's version of Palamas. This is the direction that modern Palamite studies are taking, for example. For example, according to Rossum and even Meindorf, Palamas's essence energy's distinction was actually an insistence that God really interacts with the world personally, which is precisely what Torrance wants to preserve. Finally, I'll proceed by offering a few points of extension application. Torrance and the Orthodox Reform Dialogue are seriously underutilized in the currently scholarly conversation on the doctrine of the Trinity. This paper has argued that the current scholarly consensus encapsulated by third wave Trinitarianism is to see East and West as complementary to one another. The Orthodox Reform Dialogue developed the agreed statement and ecumenical document which offers a dynamic combination of the doctrine of the Trinity in the East as traditionally understood and in the West as traditionally understood. This move is precisely the move that third wave Trinitarianism is making today. And yet Torrance and the Dialogue are not part of the conversation. As such, Torrance, the Dialogue, and in particular, the agreed statement could be much more widely used today. Furthermore, the conclusions and methods of the Orthodox Reform Dialogue have much to offer contemporary Trinitarian and ecumenical theology. As Paul Mornar puts it, Torrance's understanding of the expression that what God is toward us in history, he eternally is in himself, led him to express the classical doctrine of the Trinity in a way that makes his ideas, ideas valuable, necessary, and even revolutionary for 21st century theologians as they reflect on the implications of the Nicene faith for today." End quote. The many contributions of the Orthodox Reformed dialogue regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, notwithstanding, it might be argued that the ultimate fruit of the dialogue was its exhibition of a theological method for ecumenical dialogue and indeed ecumenical theology. Their aim as two radically different expressions of Christianity was to unknow or at least stop emphasizing their external distinctions, but to focus on their shared commitment to the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek fathers. And from this common foundation to rebuild or to use Torrance's language, reconstruct together. In his memoranda, Torrance proposes that the dialogue begin with the doctrine of the Trinity and from there, Christology, pneumatology, and then Eucharist, church, and ministry. In that order, he proposes the discussion. This initial proposal by Torrance provides a helpful template, I think, for ecumenical theology today. Indeed, Orthodox and Reformed continued along these lines, and a small helpfully traces in his essay on, ortho on the dialogue. The dialogue on the Trinity developed naturally into the dialogue on Christology, the latter of which produced the agreed statement on Christology. If theology continues to listen to Torrance 
and the dialogue and returns to the Christocentric and Trinitarian theology of Athanasius and Cyril, what might it learn? First, Torrance and the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue's use of the Nicene Homoousian continues to be underutilized today. The Homoousian drives all of Torrance's theology, not least his creative reconstruction of the fathers around it. As Holmes says, Torrance makes the Homoousian Topatri do the work that divine simplicity did for the Cappadocians, arguing that Torrance's Homoousian is, in other words, a different way of stating Rahner's rule that God really is in himself as he is to us. Similarly, Ellis says that the Filioque is an ultimately unsuccessful attempt to secure what the Homoousian rightly understood successfully accomplished. In the, third, in the current third wave Trinitarian conversations, Torrance and the dialogue's utilization of the Homoousian, despite no doubt offering a reconstruction of the term, deserves a more prevalent place. Indeed, the term does what many third waivers wish to do in their rereading of patristic Trinitarian theology. Second, the patristic, Trinitarian, and Christocentric, we confess, might be applied to an ecumenical discussion about the vicarious humanity of Christ. As Baker states, Torrance's notion this is a quote of the vicarious humanity of Christ, moreover, must be regarded as a major restatement of the Irenaean doctrine of recapitulation, from which Orthodox theologians today can learn much, particularly in relation to 20th century uses of St. Gregory Palamas, which all too often failed to relate adequately the doctrine of grace as uncreated energia to the humanity of Christ in anything more than an instrumental way, end quote. There's much concerning the role of the vicarious humanity of Christ that Orthodox and Reformed could discuss and probably agree upon on this basis. But one key issue concerns the question of Christ's assumption of fallen or unfallen humanity. We can discuss that. Similarly, Torrance brings up the possibility of a discussion of the doctrine of the Virgin Mary when he states that there is, quote, a need to rethink at a much deeper level the doctrine of the Virgin Mary. As I understand it, this would involve a deep-seated reconsideration of the relation between Christians and Jews in the one church in which both Jews and Christians have access to God the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. This is an area of Christian theology and tradition in which Roman Catholics, Lutherans, and Reformed have had to do a lot of thinking, but in which the Orthodox Church has so far done very little. Mary has to be related to the vicarious mission of Israel in the mediating of divine revelation to mankind and becomes misunderstood when detached from it. Exploring farther the vicarious humanity of Christ and Mary's relationship to it might bear much fruit in not only ecumenical and theological, but even in a religious dialogue. Perhaps a Trinitarian and Christocentric, we confess, concerning the vicarious humanity of Christ and the connection of this to the Virgin Mary would bear ecumenical fruit. In particular, certain figures and bifurcations from the Orthodox Reformed dialogue who were rejected by Torrance for their lack of emphasis on the vicarious humanity of Christ might be reconsidered. Revisiting the key issue from the Orthodox Reformed dialogue concerning the divergence of figures might bring about farther ecumenical reproachment. Third, worship in the sacraments. A Trinitarian and Christocentric patristic we confessed might bear fruit in ecumenical understandings of worship and the sacrament. Here, Torrance is the problem of Apollinarianism in the liturgy is an incredibly important essay. Colin Gutton reflects that Torrance's essay here is one of the works that needs to be extended into contemporary scholarship. The essay's surrealian understanding of worship in the sacraments is rooted entirely in the humanity of Christ, the great high priest, has much to offer today's more individualist understanding. For Torrance, baptism, worship, and Eucharist are all rooted in the vicarious humanity of Christ and must be viewed in this Trinitarian way. The approach is all the more relevant today because, as Roger, Roger Newell puts it, whether in corporate or individualistic forms, the effect on worship is the same, to eclipse Christ's humanity with our own. For example, a Eucharistic celebration may be ornately decorated with smells and bells or rival the formality of a White House lawn ceremony, or the priest, pastor, or worship leader may invest the presiding role with drama in a grand stage presence. Either approach can lead the community to focus on the rite itself, which implicitly becomes a substitute for the agency of Christ. When a Christocentric focus is absent, worship and the sacraments tend to be understood in a Unitarian rather than a Trinitarian fashion, to use the language of James Torrance. Perhaps a Trinitarian, Christocentric, and patristic we confess concerning worship and the sacraments might bear ecumenical and theological fruit, in particular bridging the pietistic differences acknowledged early in the dialogue, and indeed bridging the many differences between Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and the many Protestant varieties of worship and churchmanship. 
Perhaps this might begin through a return to the axis of the vicariously human great high priest, Jesus Christ, and his role in Trinitarian worship, steering all traditions away from a Unitarian and individualistic worship so common today. And my final point of extension, application, Lastly, a Trinitarian, Christocentric, and patristic we confess concerning ordination, marriage, and ethics might bear much fruit today, particularly concerning the issue of the ordination and marriage of homosexuals. Torrance holds that the one true priest slash minister is Jesus Christ, the great high priest. During Torrance's time, the ecumenically hot issues were the question of Presbyterian structure versus Episcopal structure and the question of the ordination of women. Torrance, without hesitation, supported a hybrid Presbyterian Episcopal structure and women being ordained, both rooted in Christ as the one great vicarious high priest. Torrance forcefully argues in particular, contra the typical argument of the conservative, conservatives of his time, which stated that because Christ was a man and the minister is an image of God, or sorry, the minister is an image of Christ, the minister must be a man. That the one true minister, Torrance argues, is Jesus Christ in whose priestly ministry the ordained minister shares. Torrance's argument cuts into the heart of the two polarized approaches to the issue of the ordination of practicing homosexuals and also homosexual marriage, I think. Torrance's intense Christocentric lens magnifies the problem with the typical approaches, both of which are unitarian and focused on the human person ministering or persons marrying rather than Christ the great high priest and the church's bride. The approach of the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue, namely their insisting that terms in theology be dynamic and open to reformation and reconstruction by the divine realities that they in human language signify, offers a new basis, I think, for the conversation. What if the debate about homosexual marriage and homosexual ordination were removed from the context of sexual, sexual ethics and placed rather into the context of the doctrines of the Trinity and Christology, and from that basis into the context of the sacraments or sacramental things if one holds to only two. At the dialogue, traditional Eastern and Western understandings of the doctrine of the Trinity and the theological language used to express this were reshaped by the realities to which they witness. Torrance took this commitment seriously and even invented new Greek patristic words to express theology. Torrance does the same with his understanding of the ordination of women. He reshapes his understanding of ministry in light of the reality, Christ the great high priest to which human ordained ministry witnesses. As Torrance puts it, quote, the idea that only a man or male can represent Christ or be an icon of Christ at the Eucharist conflicts with the basic elements in the doctrine of the incarnation and the new order of creation. Torrance concludes that through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, humanity has been set on an entirely new basis of divine grace in which there is no respect of persons. Radically, Torrance uses the classic doctrines of Trinity and Christology and the church fathers that informed them to reshape his understanding of women's ordination, ultimately concluding that theologically, there is no reason why women cannot be ordained. One rarely sees this theological, Trinitarian, Christocentric, and patristic approach today in relation to the issue of homosexual ordination, nor does one see this approach in relation to the issue of homosexual marriage. To be clear, this is not to suggest anything about whether homosexuality is right or wrong but it is rather more of a critique of the traditional liberal, we might say humanity writ large, versus biblicist, rigid framework of beliefs, to use Torrance's language, dichotomy in approaching the issue of homosexual ordination and marriage within the realm of theological ethics. Obviously, the arguments for and against women's ordination in Torrance's day were different from the arguments for and against the ordination and marriage of homosexuals today. No one considers being a woman a sin, the homosexual issue is due to the divide on whether it is a sin or not. However, that is precisely the point. Similarly to how the Reformed and Orthodox of Torrance's day differed on their approach to the filioque and therefore avoided the issue altogether directly, intentionally deciding rather to start from their shared commitment to the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek fathers and from that common ground work outwards towards an agreement uh, towards an agreed doctrine of the Trinity, which in the end bypassed their very disagreements on the filioque. The work of Torrance in the dialogue could be extended similarly to suggest that the issue of homosexual ordination might be removed from the ethics discussion, where of course those who are for homosexual ordination and those who are against differ, and placed rather into a Trinitarian and Christocentric framework 
for discussion, building off common ground and shared understanding of a Trinitarian and Christocentric understanding of ordination itself. And I think that common ground is there. Too often, the two polarized sides on the issue begin either from a biblicist or a cultural framework rather than a Trinitarian one. Therefore, the question here is really, how might we remove the issue of the ordination and marriage of homosexuals from this false dichotomy that is presented when the issue is viewed as an ethical one and place it in the realm of Trinitarian Christocentric patristic theology, answering it not from the basis of a cultural or biblicist framework, but from the basis of God's economy and self-revelation in Christ as particularized in the vicarious humanity of Christ, the great high priest. A Trinitarian and Christocentric attempt at an answer to the issue might explore ordination and marriage as sacraments, or at least sacramental, and start the discussion from an exploration of the Trinitarian and Christocentric understanding of ordination and marriage, again, rather than ethics, right, and going from there. That is to say, as Draga said to Torrance about the filioque, but replacing filioque with homosexual issue, if you start with the homosexual issue, you won't get anywhere. But if the discussion is begun with an exploration of the Trinitarian and Christocentric understanding of ordination and marriage, as seen in the Greek fathers, perhaps from there, a more fruitful discussion might develop. The Orthodox Reform Dialogue here provides an inspirational framework. An attempt at answering this question in such a way might include an exploration of Christ as Vigari's high priest in the writings of Cyril of Alexandria regarding ordination and the writings of Augustine concerning the sacraments and by extension the sacramental nature of these things. John Chrysostom's writing on marriage symbolizing Christ and his bride, the church. The Trinitarian and Christocentric sacramental approach to the issue might think about Torrance's critiques of the Roman Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception and the Protestant doctrine of inerrancy as both falling into the error of believing that the word of God cannot come to the world except via a sinless medium. If ordination and marriage are Trinitarian and Christocentric sacramental realities, can a possibly sinful and imperfect sacrament witness just as well to the grace of God in Jesus Christ? It's a question for discussion that I like to pose. When the homosexual issue that divides churches so often today is explored from within this framework, perhaps something closer to the we confess of the Orthodox Reform dialogue might begin to take shape, rather than the many divisions in Christianity today on the issue. Again, this is not a suggestion or anywhere near a suggestion of any kind of answer. It's simply saying, I wonder what it would look like to think about this within a different framework. And so, one final question is really begged of an exploration of Thomas F. Torrance and the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue. Namely, how representative is Torrance of the Reformed or even Protestant tradition in his approach? As Nesteruk says, Thomas F. Torrance clearly indicated in his personal context with uh, Nesteruk himself that in his perception of Christianity, he was Orthodox with a capital O. Torrance viewed the Greek fathers in the ecumenical councils as normative for theology. He heavily critiqued Calvinism. He visited the Greek Orthodox diocese of Alexandria, and not just Reformed churches as was traditional during his moderatorial visits. And he was honorarily ordained, or sorry, rather ordained honorary proto-presbyter in the Orthodox church. Furthermore, exhibited in Memorandum A, Torrance's ecclesiological understanding of the Reformed tradition as a Greek patristic tradition in relation to the Western church as a movement of reform within it, rather than distinct from it, oozes of Torrensian commitments, rather than maybe classically reformed. And so it must be admitted that in many ways the Orthodox reform dialogue is very Torrensian. And yet, I think therein lies its importance. Torrance spearheaded the dialogue, he trailblazed his way to Constantinople, sure of his own reformed and evangelical theological convictions, sure of the importance of the Reformation, but equally sure that the division between Reformed and Orthodox in matters of tradition did not detract from the substantial similarity they have in doctrine. Rallying other Reformed and Orthodox behind them, Torrance, Foyas, and Dragas offer an example of what great movements and agreements can flower from a deep theological rapport, quote, over the Trinitarian and Christocentric theology of the Greek fathers. If Torrance is not representative of the Reformed and Protestant traditions, well, he should be. Torrance is here doing the Reformation right, and there is much to learn from him, and from Foyas, Dragas, and from the Orthodox Reformed Dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>